Welcome to Simple Man's Comics. It is a new week, and if you want to know what's hot and cold in comics, then you've come to the right place, because tonight we are premiering the next hot and cold list for June 5th, 2019. I'm your host, Brian, with Simple Man's Comics. With me is my co-host, Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. Tell him what's good, Jack. Thank you, Brian. I am Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo, and we are here for another week with the Hot and Cold Show where we put together the eight top spec superstars to create our spec super team. These are writers from comicbookinvest.com, CBSI Nation members, and members of the Simpleman's Comics YouTube family coming together to form this spec super team and put together this great list. So we're going to roll right into the hot list this week, starting with the first pick from Peter Renna. What's up, everybody? My hot pick for this week is going to piggyback off of last week's Bolo show, and that would be Vault Amish covers. Uh, I'm not saying they're all going to set the secondary market on fire, but I'm just a fan of uh, Amish covers in general, and Vault's been doing them right. Uh, they're not always picking the most obvious ASM 300 covers or things like that. They're doing more interesting things, like that Tomb of Dracula they did for uh, The Savage Shores number 1, which is still a $50 book, at least, if you can find it. Uh, but they just had the Saga homage for... Uh, she uh, said destroyed this week, and they had the Deep Roots that had a Swamp Thing, Fearscape had a Sandman, there was a Daredevil 184 on Friendo number one, and uh, they even got a couple more coming in July that I added to my pull list for uh, Resonant having a Why the Last Man, which I think is also pretty cool. And uh, of course, we can't forget that uh, CBSI had their own homage here with that Detective Comics for Queen of Bad Dreams, also a fan of that. So uh, again, they're not all going to be uh, making you tons of money, but maybe they're long-term holds. I just like them, so that's what's hot for me this week. All right, Jack, so Peter's coming out the gate with Vault Vintage. We've talked about Vault Vintage numerous times on the Bolo Show, as he even referenced, especially with last week with that saga homage of She Said Destroy. What do you think of Peter's pick? Well, I like Peter's pick. Um, I definitely don't see them making a whole lot of waves in the secondary market, but they are extremely popular with collectors. And that's something that, that's important to note when we're talking about something being hot versus cold. An item can be hot, it can sell well, sell out at distributor level, sell out at retailer level, and be in demand with collectors while not yet hitting those secondary market highs that we're used to seeing from certain types of products that land on these types of hot lists. And that's the beauty of this type of list. Um, it, it's more encompass, uh, uh <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it's more of an overview of the industry as a whole. And these vault vintage books have been in demand for some time, ever since the Savage Shores number one, that second print really drove up in price and drew a lot of attention. And as Peter talked about, some of the upcoming releases have moved into the modern market. Uh, we've even seen one he didn't mention, I, I saw a Transmopolitan, uh, homage, coming up in the uh, coming months. So I think that's something to keep an eye on. And yes, we at CBSI, of course, we did uh, a vault vintage, part of the vault uh, retailer vintage program, and we were able to put one together, and we may have more on the way in the future, so definitely be on the lookout for that. But uh, I, I see these books really as long-term plays, especially if Vault being such a new publisher, really starting to get some momentum in the market. If they can get some of these properties adapted, anything can happen. And then these are going to be the books that are going to be in demand in the secondary market. These these lower printed homage covers that really connect on a nostalgia level. So, yeah, and I'll even take it a step further with those Vault homage covers. Or the artists that have been doing them, a lot of them have been doing them from Tim Daniel and Nathan Gooden. Like Nathan Gooden did the... Uh, Tomb of Dracula cover, but Tim Daniel does a lot of those as well, especially with those new uh, non-homage covers, but that last release for The Savage Shores with that Mondo-style print. All those, we've talked to them before on the Bolo Show, and all those, I think, kind of fall into that vault vintage niche that they're talking about, but I definitely think those are hot, and I think, like we kind of said, more long, long term down the road, I think those will tend to pop more. Absolutely. And they're always going to be in some sort of demand because of that nostalgic feel and it connecting with a collector base. Right. So rolling right on into the hot list this week, our next pick comes from the Run the Table author, Clint Jocelyn. Good afternoon, CBS Nation. This is Clint Jocelyn coming to you. I write Run the Table, do your daily poll, all that good stuff. I wanted to come with the hot pick of the week. And the hot pick of the week, you got a small window to do this, but you could really make some money off of, is anything that, involving this guy right here, Godzilla. With the movie coming out. There's a lot of books that are moving right now, comics and or graphic novels that are moving quite well online. And if you got, 
get them in, get them up, and get them flipped. Because of the movie coming out, there's a small window, and there's a lot of fanatics for Godzilla and all that lore and all that world that's created with that, especially with Mothra and the whole gang being in this next movie. I would highly recommend if you have these books, get them and flip them and make some money. So my hot pick of the week, anything related to Godzilla. So Jack, there we have Clint's hot pick, Godzilla. I know the movie just hit theaters, usually right before and right around release. Those movies, comic issues around those movies start catching a buzz. What do you think about Clint's pick? I like Clint's pick. Um, I, I definitely think there was a kind of a lackluster buzz going into this movie, but it, it seems to be that people who have seen it, the reports are real positive about the movie. I, it seems to be a real, like Clint mentioned, universe building and brings in more characters. Um, as far as comics are concerned, we haven't seen a lot of demand for Godzilla comics. Godzilla number one has had its day where at times the original Marvel book has been in some sort of a demand. It's always a kind of popular back issue. As well as the IDW incentives for the Godzilla in Hell variants. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, one or two of them have popped up on Ben Stein's Hot Ten list on comicbookadvest.com. So, I think Clint's right. This is a, a timing play. If you've got Godzilla books, if you've got, um, whether it's graphic novels or we'll, we'll discuss toys, models, um, anything of that nature, Godzilla, and you're looking to sell, now is the time because one thing Brian and I talk about is um, SEO, search engine optimization. And right now, people are going to be searching Godzilla. As people watch this movie, they're going to go and look, and it's good. hopefully you'll bring some lapsed fans back. And while this movie may not be like a box office smash success, it, it, because it's getting good reviews and because it's done well, I think there'll be a lingering popularity with this movie. Um, and it'll probably end up on some sort of a streaming service or HBO or something like that. And, and will end up being a movie that hopefully will continue the popularity and lore of kind of these kaiju monsters in America. And we'll get more movies, hopefully some new comic product, um, but yeah, if, if you're looking to sell, timing play. We said we talk about this too on the Bolo show. You know, uh, real estate is location, location, location. Speculation is timing, timing, timing. So you got to know your movie schedules. You should have known when this movie was coming out and have those listings already scheduled to go up right prior to that movie release. Yeah, and also whenever the first trailer hits. Absolutely, that's, usually... that's really the prime time. That's right. why you see like the kitchen on the hot ten yeah. list right now after the kitchen trailer debuts right. yeah there's multiple stages option news it always catches a spike casting news if, there, if there's key casting news catches a spike and then of course first trailer and as you get closer to release it's still kind of hot but that's when you're starting to trail down to the end of that cycle and that's when you definitely want to be listing them because usually at post release is when they start cooling back off again but at least that's that's how my, my observation do you agree with that jack oh a hundred a hundred percent and it all depends on kind of your goals for when you're trying to get out as far as when you bought in, as well as uh, when you bought in. Because um, sometimes, you know, you may buy in and the lull between when that option gets announced and then when that trailer gets announced, prices will kind of drop back in. You may buy back in. So now you've got to wait for that next cycle. But Brian's absolutely right. You're waiting on those jump off points. And your last jump off point is that movie being released. So if right now, if you've got Godzilla product, you need to move quickly because people are searching right now. Will they be looking two months from now? We don't know. Yep. Yeah, one of the huge windows you had was, was Thanos. Like with that first Avengers, that post credit scene, yeah. that was like the first tip-off point with Thanos where majority of the people that went and saw the movie didn't even know who the hell Thanos was unless you were real, you know, unless you read comic books. But then you had a long trail there leading all the way up to Infinity War and once they cast Josh Brolin before that, like I said, those are all types in the cycle where you can uh, list some of those books and, and flip them. But Oh, absolutely. The books the books we were able to find back then in dollar boxes, we couldn't dream of now. Yeah. So there we have Godzilla for Clint's pick. Rolling on into the next pick, we have the cover tunes author Mike Morello with the cool at, at shoes from last week. But this week... He's sporting some different shoes, and let's check out the pick that he has for us. Hey everybody, Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes with this week's Hot Pick, and this week I am going with both of the main two Conan the Barbarian titles from Marvel. Both are really fantastic reads. If you're not reading them, you should be. Um, they feel like they come right out of the 1970s, 
literally as if they picked up where the Roy Thomas runs left off. I am particularly partial to the Conan the Barbarian over Savage sort of Conan. Um, Jason Aaron is really crushing this right now. There's great covers from Asad Ribic, although this happens to be a Sienkiewicz variant. Um, and the Savage Sword title has also great covers, also a great story. Uh, a lot of Ross art on the covers, and again, great interior art. And they're really, really good, and they're also bolstering values of the old vintage books. So, for instance, a copy of Conan the Barbarian number one, which you would have been able to get for about 60, 70 bucks a year ago, now you'd be hard pressed to get this book for less than 200. And it seems like values are going up about 10 to 15 percent every month. Um, and nice copies are getting scarcer and scarcer, uh, which has also caused the other keys to go up, like Red Sonia's first cameo appearance and Red Sonia's first full appearance in Conan, which I think is also due to how good the Dynamite series has been. Um, Dynamite has revamped the Red Sonia series. They've done a really great job, really great cover art, fantastic interior art, and a really fun story um, with some really rare variants, by the way. So if you're not paying attention to those, especially the Virgin variants, like this Tedesco for number three, literally a ghost. When it does pop up, it's a $100 book. Um, also, the Joe Jusco version variant for number two, and there was a trade dress for number one with the same art sort of close up. These are also ghosts. They're $100, $125 bucks if, they, if they come up. I've only seen a couple of each of these sell, um, which, of course, has in turn caused other variants for Red Sonia to go up, mostly the Perillos, which uh, have always been hot. I mean, Red Sonia is, let's face it, one of the hot girls of comics since she began in the 70s, um, but that's caused a lot of her old Perillo variants to go up as well. This one, my personal favorite, number 23, Queen Sonia. Um, fantastic. You could have gotten this book for maybe 20 bucks a year ago. Now this is close to a $100 book. Um, so you've got those, and you've got her origin book coming soon with some great variants. I know the Shannon Mayer sold out. I know the Ken Lim sold out. So you've got two great uh, series for Red Sonia from Dynamite, which are really fun. You've got two great Conan series from Marvel, which are also really great and really fun. All great reads, all great art on the covers and in the interiors. And if we get to see Red Sonia and or Conan back in the theaters in the next few years, some of these really rare variants and uh, keys could really see um, a big, big gain in value. Um, so they're not only my hot pick from a reading perspective and just a fun perspective, but also for a potential investment perspective if we see some film or TV from these characters. That's my hot pick for the week. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. So there we go, Jack. We have Mike Morello's pick this week. As always, though, before we get into his pick, every time he's sporting some different shoes, this time he's got a Pong hat, this time he's got a Blade Runner poster in the background. It's like he changes up the whole scenery. This guy's like, you know what he reminds me of? Mike Damone from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I'm pretty sure he's out there hawking concert tickets and all types of stuff. But Mike Morello is Mike Damone, and that's it. I mean, he just took a time machine, and he's now. But I digress. Let's get into his picks. He's talking about the new Conan series. I would even say that to sum up his pick in more general would be it's basically that Con that whole Conan universe right now. He touched on hot issues from Red Sonja. He touched on hot issues from Conan, past, present, and he's talking about future. But what do you think of Mike's picks? I really like Mike's picks. And I'm going to tell you, I think it's a lot like Peter Rennes' pick earlier where people may scoff and say, well, that's not hot on the secondary market. But here's why it is hot. It's hot because of the things that he talked about. It's increasing the awareness of a character and the entire universe that may be getting attention from the modern day collector. And we talk a lot on, on, on this channel, on the various shows, about different demographics of collector and the fact that some of the newer, younger collectors are really driving this secondary market. Well, you know, they didn't grow up watching the Conan the Barbarian movies, Brian, like you and I did. I know you're a big Conan fan, but these younger kids, um, I have a brother who's 13 years younger than me, and I would venture to guess he's probably never seen the original Conan movies. Um, and the Conan movies that he probably has seen weren't that good. So his idea of Conan is, is far different. And what these comics are getting to do is expose a new audience to this character. And I think the real importance, and it's something that I think got kind of overlooked, was the, um, the No Road Home appearance where Conan appeared with the Avengers. Because I think it solidified Conan in the eyes of, say, these casual superhero uh, fans that wait a minute this is this isn't just some like old time character this isn't just some medieval character this is something that is marvel 
it really put the Marvel stamp on Conan going into even the Savage Avenger series, which I know is like incredibly popular, but it's, it still gives validity to the character. And I really think an accurate comparison for this Conan series and what Marvel's been able to do with it is what they were able to do with Star Wars. When they brought in the Star Wars property from Dark Horse, they brought the property in, and yeah, they, they printed a bunch of covers like they did with Conan, and they did retailer incentives like they did with Conan, or retailer exclusives, excuse me, like they did with Conan. And, um, you know, the, there wasn't that immediate secondary market success, but slowly but surely they brought in more readers. And this is something I'll tell you, if you go to a comic shop and you look at young readers and you ask young readers what they are purchasing, so many young readers are in the comic shops buying Star Wars titles. And I think that that comes from the movies being on TV, uh, on the big screen right now. But a lot of it comes from these new series that are constantly popping up that have seemed to really grab kids' attention. So while Conan may not be skewed towards kids, Conan being released and being kind of exposed to these to a new, whole new fan base, a whole, whole new group of readers, is increasing its kind of viability within the market, which ends up driving up those secondary market prices of those key issues that Mike talked about in his video. So which is why it's interesting that Mike will talk about it because there's nobody who's more of a Star Wars fanatic than Mike in CBSI. So it's I think it's a valid point to make to see the kind of symmetry to what Marvel has done from a marketing perspective with Conan to what Star Wars. The, the key to where they can kind of bring everything full circle is to see what Disney can do with Conan as far as a movie franchise. But while the secondary market values of these Conan books may not be popping on eBay, Brian and I talk a lot about the value of live sales, and I think these are books that collectors are going to be looking for in back issue bins for years to come. Um, and each of these Conan books has gone to late printing. Some of the late printing artwork is stellar, and I think it's been really kind of under-talked about and underseen in the market, and I really encourage you to people to go check out some of these books, but I, I absolutely agree that I think that the Conan the Barbarian line is the top dog, but I also would say be on the lookout for Central great covers. They've also gone to late printings. A lot of these incentives right now are, are affordable in the market, and it's not too late to get in and really get these books and get, get a good grasp of these books early right now as these this series is going to progress and all of these Conan related series are going to progress because if it ends up getting to the point where we're releasing movies and the back issue popularity continues to increase at the percentage that Mike talks about in the video, you're going to, want to take advantage of this buying opportunity in this window to buy that we have right now versus a year, two years, five years from now when who knows what the popularity of Conan will be. Right. Like I always said, my pullbacks right now consist of mostly independents, but I have a couple big two titles in there, and that's Conan the Barbarian, Savage Sword of Conan, and Daredevil. Those are the only big two titles I have in my box. And like I said, I've enjoyed both those issues, and I think it does deserve a spot on the hot list. I think anything Jason Aaron does could potentially wind up on the hot list. Yep. So rolling along on the hot list this week, our next pick comes from the Reading Pile author himself, Dan Piercy. You said she wants to see you bolo. Man, I don't even know what that means. Hey, how you doing? This is Dan Piercy with D. Piercy's Comics, which forwards my article, The Reading Pile, on CBSI. So, my hot pick this week is reading comics. And what I mean by that is, in the last 12 months or so, we've seen titles like Pearl, Bone Parish, Old Lady Harley, Immortal Hulk, Road of Bones, etc. get hot on the secondary market, and I, it is more to do with the content of these books as opposed to, you know, a hot, flashy store variant cover limited edition blah. so uh i think it would behoove all of us to read these things and uh i got a buddy on instagram who goes by the surname of comic jabroni and he's he's got a saying and it's uh if you want to know a thing or two you gotta read a thing or two so that's my hot pick Reading comics. I'll see ya. So there we have Dan's pick, Jack. We've mentioned time and time again, especially on the Bolo Show, that one of the best tools in speculation is to actually read the comics. So that way you can speculate on what's going to occur later on and further issues. And Dan kind of highlights that point. What do you think about it, Jack? 
Well, I really like this pick. Obviously, it's one we've we've talked about, and you may notice Dan's shirt in the video. He's got the Io Shirai shirt. Dan's a big wrestling fan, and uh, as ComicBookInvest.com's reading pile writer, he goes into a bit of a, a self promo here, talking about the value of reading as a resident reading reviewer. But uh, I think he's spot on. Um, we've talked about it before. There's a couple different things that reading comics gives you as a speculator. Obviously, the obvious thing reading's fun. It should be why we all. Uh, originally get into it uh you know the benefits to your life are you know there's tons but beyond that from a purely speculation monetary standpoint it helps you a couple different ways when you're talking about new series indie titles like he talked about bone parish um pearl series like that um reading the series are what really are going to give you the quickest idea of well is this something that's adaptable is this something that i could see other people jumping on can i picture a Netflix doing this? Um, is this more of a TV property versus movie property? And these are the things that are important today in the market. So, you know, it, a, a book like Bone Parish, as an example, a book that we we really kind of talked about, and I almost want to say broke some news that it's not quite official, but there's some rumors percolating um, on this channel. Uh, you know, that's a book that was talked about, but wasn't really popping off in the market right upon release. Uh, I know Brian it was in your weekly picks. I think you were kind of one of the first people to ever talk about it. But, you know, it, it was a book. I don't think it ended up on the Bolo list. I'll, I'll go ahead and say I probably missed it. Dan talked about it early on in the reading pile. Um, I think it was an Indie Spotlight series book that Andy highlighted. But, you know, it was a book that readers and the reader buzz and momentum grew. So if you were the type of person who read this book, could tell that this was a book that was going to be popular the way it's become popular some eight, nine months later you could have gotten ahead of this book. From If you're talking about like big two and first appearances, the other value of reading is what Brian talked about as far as seeing where the story is going to go and where appearances are going to be showing up. You can also judge kind of like the importance of a first appearance because every week, we talk about it on the CBSI Bolo show right here on Simple Women's Comics every Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We talk about the number of first appearances that show up on a weekly basis, and a lot of them aren't that important and aren't that key. And you don't know which ones are and which ones aren't without reading. And we talk about it all the time. When you talk about the big two, you got to follow the money, see where they're putting their money behind. And the best way to see that is to read the comic. Who do they? Who's the story invested in? Who's on the cover? Who are they promoting on social media? These are things um, that are easier for you to discern and see if you're actually reading the book. So, you know, to my speculators out there, I know myself, aka Mr. Bolo, I'm a, you know, I'm more of a monetary comics guy. Uh, you know, I'm in it for the for the flip. But I read comics on a weekly basis, and the every month, every year that I'm in the comics industry, I read more and more comics. I hear a lot of people saying they read less. But I think you should do I read more and more. And the more I read, the more successful I am. And I'm able to get into new fields and new areas in the comic book industry that I wouldn't have gotten if I wasn't reading. So I, I, I think Dan's I think Dan's spot on. I think that the reading is valuable. And Brian and I took a lot of heat early on when we kind of partnered up on content. And we wanted that to be kind of like not a manifesto, but one of our kind of um our talking points is the value of reading. And people told us, no, you know, we don't care what <laughs> books you, we don't care what books you want to read every week. Like, you know, we just, who freaking reads? Sell. We just want to know what to go out and buy. Right. Just tell us what to buy, what's going to sell. And, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to hear about it, but I feel very confident. Some, I think four months, five months later that Brian and I have been able to prove the value of reading time and time again. And if you don't believe us, then please, Tune into the CBSI Bolo Show Thursday nights because we will talk about it on a weekly basis on the value of reader buzz and what that can do, especially within indie comics, but even within the big two. That brings up a good point or an observation that I've had is enjoy reading comics. It seems like the number one speculation go-to, right, when you read a comic book is everyone instantly thinks, like you may even mention it, whether it would or would not be good for option. And it... It's that's just where we are with everything is so media driven right. that as soon as you read a story, the first thing that pops on your head from a speculation standpoint is, oh, man, I could see this being a Netflix show. I could see this being a movie. But no one ever says, oh, I could see this being really hot and a TV show on sci fi because <laughs> you just don't see much. Sure. You just, I mean, there's good shows on sci fi. Deadly Class is great. Happy is great. But 
it's what? almost it's, I want to see that speculation again, like kind of how a Mortal Hulk built, where the first thing was not so much oh this would be good movie TV show, but this is a damn good freaking story. I can't read to see the next issue. And then that word of mouth from that reader buzz build up. But it's just the, the nature of the beast right now. I mean, I'll, I'm guilty of doing it as well, where I'll read something and go, man, I could see this being a Netflix show. I also think it depends on whether you're talking about big two versus indie. Because I think when you're talking indie, we, we've talked about it with the indie uh, spotlight series show. We've talked to a number of creators. There's not a lot of money in, in indie print comics. Where they make their money is adapting it, optioning. So the reality is optioning is everything. And what you said about sci-fi, that's something like that, a scenario like that is, is dead serious. It's, where it's spot on. But that's where it goes to, like where you were talking earlier in the show about the life cycle of, of a sale. When you, when you get optioned to sci-fi, you don't have that maybe full lifestyle. You can't kind of afford to wait till that release. You kind of need to sell upon yep. the initial option. That's your window. Um, but if you get that Netflix pickup, now, look at Umbrella Academy. Even six months after it's out, there's still so much value in in those in those books, and it's kind of sky's the limit. So it, it kind of all depends. But big two, you have the, a better chance of a series coming out that people will kind of pan. Uh, I, I, there was um, people were almost disinterested in Immortal Hulk. Another example is Bat Fraction's Hawkeye run. You know, who cares about Hawkeye? Well, look at you know, Pearl. Like this hot run. You can look at Pearl right now. Right, and I think Pearl is a, a timely one because, um, you know, I think we I, we just talked about Bendis. I think it was on the Bolo show. Yeah. We just talked about uh, Brian Michael Bendis, follow the money. He was brought into D.C. to do something. And um, it wasn't but a day after you and I talked about that on the mic yeah. that I think he announced uh, that the Pearl movie was coming. Well, me, my personal opinion, I didn't like Pearl. I don't care about Pearl. I don't care that's option. To me, it's just like freaking Mark Millar books. From Netflix, everything's going to be done. So kudos to those making money off Pearl, but it's definitely not in my wheelhouse as far as books that I like to pick up. Now, I do like Young Justice. I think Brian Michael Bennis is doing a kick-ass job on Young Justice. And I do like Naomi, which a lot of people do or don't like, but that's just because the attention that she's been getting. But I think we're kind of, sorry for the viewers, we're kind of going off base here, getting out of the hot and cold list. We're getting more into what really grinds my gears type stuff i guess you could say but it's great conversation and like you said brian michael bennis was brought there to make money and and he's doing what he was brought there to do but it all goes back to yes reading comics is the main foundation for speculation and that's why he put it on the hot list this week and with that we're going to move right along in the hot list and we are going to go with the hot 10 author himself ben stein not that ben stein different one and he's coming right here can't win his money. Hey everybody, it's Ben Stein, writer of the CBSI comicbookinvest.com hot 10 list. Uh, my hot pick this week is Black Cat. She's got a new series coming out, tons of variants. Uh, people are picking up all kinds of different ones. Um, a lot of really good artists uh, trying to make a really nice depiction of the character and uh, she just continues to sell. That's uh, Anyway, that's my hot pick for this week. So there we have it, Hot 10 author himself. His hot pick for the week is Black Cat, especially with the release of the new Black Cat series coming out this week. It does bring attention to Black Cat in general, especially with those already skyrocketed variants out there, especially Spider-Man 194 that people are still looking for, and all those homage variants in between. What do you think about Black Cat? Well, I agree, and I think there's a lot of meat on the bone with Black Cat. We still haven't seen Black Cat show up in a, a Spider-Man movie with kind of Spider-Man movies having kind of a couple incarnations. And it really seems like they've got something going with the group that they have right now. So I certainly think there's a lot of value still left to be had with Black Cat. There's also a lot of talk about Black Cat getting kind of a, um, a spin-off, kind of female-oriented Spider-Verse movie. So with that, the new series, I think uh, you made a great point in the uh, Wednesday Warrior article today about how long will this series last? Will it get 12 issues? We don't know. Um, let's be honest. Black Cat's popularity comes from covers. It's uh, comic book fans like these kind of buxom covers. I'm trying to be polite about it, but they like these kind of uh, pin-up women covers. It's low-hanging fruit, and it's always done really well. And when you look at the Spider-Man series... <coughs> There's really no character that's done consistently better than Black Cat when you look at variants. So when you take a book like this and it's a new Marvel number one and you make it open for stores to do retailer 
exclusive variants and then in turn reach out to the greatest artists in the game yeah you're going to get some amazing covers and like we've seen from some of the some of the biggest heavyweights from j scott campbell doing multiple store variants as well as his own um to uh perio um uh, any number of artists top top from top to bottom have done a uh cover it seems like for this book and, and then the incentives there's so many incentives and nothing bothers me more than like a trade dress incentive and a virgin incentive because it just devalues the trade dress incentive altogether makes it kind of pointless um so yeah i i i like the pick because i do agree that right. pick you could list black a J, you could list a j scott campbell black cat variant right now and they'll probably sell within 48 hours right but i i don't like black cat in general other than the movie aspect of it the fact that i don't she hasn't hit a movie yet so i think that there's some popularity there um this upcoming black cat number one release i i I don't love also i think it's tough from a store variant perspective obviously brad we produce store variants with comicbookinvest.com cbsi um if you go to comicbookinvest.com click on the variants tab We, we have a couple in stock right now uh be on the lookout for more coming soon but, you know, this that this is the kind of book when you and I have discussed what books we want to do versus what we don't, that we don't want to do because there's so many variants. It's tough to compete. You have to go and get a top cover artist. And then even if that top cover artist does a great cover, there's so many other covers out there. Um, it, it does become kind of flooded in the market. So it, it, it's really tough. So will some of these covers do better than their initial selling price? Yes, probably. Um, will a lot of people get caught holding expensive black cat variants uh, that they probably can't sell for what they paid? I think so, yes. So it's something to, it's something to keep an eye out for. I think that ASM 194 is probably the best book uh, long term uh, to, to keep an eye out for. Right. And I want to do something also here because it's too expensive for me to, to participate in this game. But... I think a key will be to watch that 1 in 500 J. Scott Campbell variant for this. See if it stays, see if it goes up, see if it drops. But that's another thing for those that are watching this video. Go ahead and put in the comment, what do you think that 1 in 500 J. Scott Campbell virgin variant for Black Cat number one that's coming out, that came out today, do you think it's good? Because I see them, what is it, 1 in 500? I know Slapped Heroes was selling a 9.8 guaranteed for 5.99, I believe. What do you guys think about that? Do you think it'll stay at that price, eventually drop, or do you think it will go up? Go and put that in the comments down below. Now, it's important to note that any store that did a store exclusive variant that printed up 3,000 of a store exclusive variant, of course, they're getting six of those one in 500 variants. So a lot of what's going to happen with the price, and this is just my opinion, um, it is going gonna, is gonna to be determined by what those stores do. How do they handle it? Um, what pricing do they set for for that book because if you go and were to put say six up on ebay at a reasonable price but below market it could really negatively affect the market on a book that there's really not going to be a lot of out there so it'll be it'll be interesting to see so definitely let us know in the comments what you guys think uh the price of that book will be kind of set at over the next right. coming weeks right and we were talking a lot about the new series but we want to reiterate ben's pick was black cat in general and he does has a point. Those com- There's a lot of those Black Cat covers out there that sell, and they're selling even hot right now with that new series coming out. So thanks, Ben, for that pick, and it definitely deserves to be on the hot list this week. So rolling on to the next pick in the hot list this week, we have the indie spotlight writer himself, Andy Tomberlin. Hey, what's up, CBSI Nation? Andy here, indie spotlight series. What's hot this week? Seems like the 80s properties are making a, a resurgence and a comeback here. Uh, when you talk about things like G.I. Joe, uh, you talk about things like Transformers, uh, Ghostbusters, uh, Mask being rumored to have a movie coming, uh, even going back to Thundercats. All of these properties seem to be catching a little heat and uh, coming back full circle. And I, for one, couldn't be happier and uh, ready to see where they where they take these things. So, yeah, that's my hot uh, 80s properties uh, making a comeback. So there we have it. There's Andy's pick and Jack. I could tell you I could probably spend two hours right now talking about that pick alone because there's so many different ways you can go with that. I definitely think he's got a point there. Definitely think it's a hot pick because you're seeing there's a new Masters of the Universe movie in production. You're seeing news about G.I. Joe has resurgent, especially with some of their variants. You've been seeing um, the Thundercats and Masters of the Universe miniseries. You're seeing all these comics and you got 
new Ghostbusters Transformers crossover coming from IDW. So it's definitely hot. It might not be like super hot on the secondary market, but it's been heating up. And I'm anxious to know what your thoughts are on this because you talk about a lot of these titles on the Bolo Show a lot of the right. time. Well, yeah, I think you know my thoughts on this. There is nothing I'm more of an advocate for than these properties. I think it's the next up. It's the next up item. It's the thing that people are overlooking. Um, we're talking about a lot of properties that, as, as these movie universes are being established, every studio wants their universe. And, you know, Marvel can only go with Disney, and DC is with Warner. And that's where you're seeing Sony pick up Bloodshot and look for Valiant. That's where you're going to see all Spark Productions in the Hasbro universe and what they're doing, I believe, with Paramount, but it's that's what you're going to see with them. And everybody wants a piece of this kind of comic book, nerd culture, uh, movie explosion. So all of these properties that you named, from G.I. Joe, Mask, to like out, some of the more outside stuff like Thundercats, which has been kind of off the radar for a while, these are all properties dying for major motion picture releases, dying for rebooted toys to be in stores. Um, I, you know, I'm a father of children. You're a father of children. Um, there are a lot of these toys that our kids have not yet been exposed to. And, you know, it's all about accessibility. Properties are becoming more and more popular. But one thing we talk about on the Bolo Show all the time, if you're a Bolo Show watcher, I've given you a long-term play of the week involving G.I. Joe, involving Transformers, involving Ghostbusters that um, I'll allow me to humble brag for a minute. If you would have taken me up on it, you could have made some money on several, several times over. Um, because the reality is that there's a market for this stuff, but people are overlooking it. And I, we talk about it on the show a lot of times that, you know, now is the time to get in on this while it's kind of ground floor, while there's so many doubters to it. The people who these uh, properties target are becoming decision makers within the Hollywood system, as well as financial decision makers within the household. Um, so these properties are definitely ones that I think are, are absolutely on the rise and ones to be kind of keeping an eye out for going forward. I'll also say it's a great timing. I think everybody should check out. If you like the shirts that Brian and I wear a lot of times on the Simplements Comics YouTube uh, channel, as well as a lot of stuff where you see us on social media. We wear those CBSI shirts with the various character designs. Well, if you head to cbsiswag.com right now, they just released some new designs involving Skeletor from Masters of the Universe, as well as a G.I. Joe design. So, you know... Yep. I ordered both today. And, I've, and thank you, thank you, thank you for the Skeletor, because I think Big Leg and I have been bug, bugging them for a good year and a half for Skeletor. <laughs> But it's that, and what's great about it, it's it's going to be made with glow-in-the-dark ink, so the Skeletor and stuff is going to glow in the dark when you don't have lights on, so yeah. But looking forward to that. Place my order today for both the G.I. Joe and the Skeletor CBSI shirts. Yeah, just incredible. Um, to talk, talk about, as a G.I. Joe diehard, a great surprise to see that we were going to be releasing a CBSI G.I. Joe shirt. So yeah, so absolutely. Um, you know, I just want to make sure everybody out there knows, head to cbsiswag.com and check that out, because... Yeah, you know, it's really timely right now. It's 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 really a move to make. Um, if you if you continue to speculate on areas of the market that everybody else is speculating on, that's when you end up, you know, dropping a brick the way we saw with like Red Goblin and things like that. The way you avoid that is to play in these kind of ponds and pools where you're seeing less competition, but there's still a demand. Don't don't, don't go where there's no demand. But is a demand for these '80s properties. Uh, the children of the '80s have grown up, and they've got more. Now is the time. It's con season. Hit those back issue bins. Uh, look for those back issues, and start loading up on those issues in preparation for what's coming over the next few years. And don't forget, we've got Ghostbusters 2020 coming out next year, which uh, Sony seems to have some serious high hopes for revitalizing the Ghostbusters franchise. Right. Plus, there's some cool storylines coming up in the G.I. Joe, so make sure you're paying attention to that. And some great covers coming up in the G.I. Joe series up from IDW. But. Yeah, G.I. Joe 266. We'll go ahead and put that bowl out right now. Be on the lookout for G.I. Joe 266, starting a brand new Snake Eyes themed story. Um, it's kind of their like once a year big story. one to keep an eye out for. I believe it'll run 266 through 270. 270 and then yeah like brian said a few covers then there will be multiple incentives they'll be connecting covers it's uh one to keep an eye out for yeah 
some gorgeous action figure variants, which hate to say it because they've worn themselves out, but these action figure variants are actually pretty cool looking. So definitely look forward to those. Yeah, they, they took a unique approach with it. Right. But yes, great pick. Definitely 80s franchises. And that's like you, you mentioned a great point is the people that have that disposable income right now grew up on that and they're buying pure nostalgia, which is perfect because it touches that emotional element and the emotional makes you spend money. And so people are buying up those franchises. Rolling into our next pick in the hot list this week, we have Topher the Mass Speculator. What's up, Speculator? You know what? Today, I'm going to step out of character for a minute. You know who's hot this week? Idris Elba. Yeah, I said it. He was great in Prometheus. And yeah, I said that too. That movie was awesome. Now, he's a genetically modified villain in a rock film, which is going to make a boatload. And he was cast as the Bronze Tiger. Man, I need a Bronze Tiger mask. A perfect casting should help those bronze tiger keys. There are a few books everyone's already after. But there's no doubt that the bronze tiger is hot this week. Personally, I like Suicide Squad 67 for the cover. And DC Comics Presents number 39 is a real sneaky pick. Especially if Gunn does what I suspect. See you next week. Topher mentions Idris Elba. There's no doubt Idris Elba is probably one of the biggest movie stars around right now. Whenever he gets cast in something, people pay attention. And the fact that he's being cast in James Gunn's new Suicide Squad movie. Remember when they first had casting for the last Suicide Squad movie? And how crazy speculation went. How crazy the Suicide Squad issues went. The Harley Quinn issues. So he's touching on some of those issues here with Idris Elba as the Bronze Tiger. What do you think about his pick, Jack? Well, yeah, I, I like it. But I it, I agree with what you're saying. That's why I kind of say proceed with caution with the Suicide Squad stuff. Because you got to remember what happened last time. Um, and you also have to remember that some of these appearances, think Deadpool 2, um, could end up being very short appearances, less than what you kind of expect. <laughs> so it's something you got to watch out for. Um, but, you know, another thing also to be cautioned with is um, Idris Elba's last couple of comic book related roles didn't really do anything for him uh, in the secondary market, whether it was his Thor appearance or his uh, Dark Tower appearance. But I agree with what Topher says here that, um, you know, I have a faith, I have faith in James Gunn that he's going to make this Suicide Squad movie for DC Comics, what it was intended to be, kind of their Guardians of the Galaxy. And uh, I have faith in what James Gunn will do with that. And I think Idris Elba is a big star who can only really benefit from being in that position. And those Bronze Tiger keys are affordable. So when you look at books with meat on the bone, I think that, that you know, it's it's a pretty safe play. Uh, it, they didn't really pop the way um, you would have maybe thought initially with, say, the uh, Michael Jai White playing Bronze Tiger on Arrow. So, you know, there's still meat on the bone of that, of that book. That, that book didn't really see that kind of secondary market spike. So it's still one to be looking for in those back issue bins because I think it's still probably a pretty affordable book. Right. And I don't care, you could cast him in whatever role you want him in, but he's always Stringer Bell to me. Yes. <laughs> and coming in with our last pick this week for the hot list, we have Mel V from the Mighty Mel V YouTube channel. What up, what up, what up? This is Mel V with Hot and Cold for this week. Um, hot for me this week was um, trying to find unintentional, funny, vintage comic books. Like those Archie books and that Revelman book, stuff like that, but stuff that... Nobody has caught on to yet. Um, I think those are hilarious. Jack, what do you think of Mel's pick this week? Well, I, I think Mel's on to something here because if you look at the hot 10 list, we have seen that Betty and Veronica issue where she's jumping into the pool show up a couple times and we, it's increased in price. It's not the first time we've seen that, um, especially within the Archie universe. We've seen a lot of those older Archie issues, whether they were dealing with you know, um, Archie ogling the women or possible drug usage. And most of the time, these, these references were very innocent at the time, but in hindsight, look to mean something different. Um, another example of a book that's kind of gotten popular with that kind of a niche crowd is that ALF book with the seal. Um, what, you know, that's another one where it, its popularity is really based on, yeah, rarity, but also kind of its, um, it's kind of, Undertones. Reputation. Yeah, the undertones of the cover. So, um, yeah, I think the, 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 it, chasing these books is difficult because there isn't, per se, a database of dirty covers. So um, that may be something one day CBSI has to tackle. But, 
you know, it's not it it's not an easy thing to do. And there's a lot of these, the market is really fluid on. So what a, a book was going for a couple months ago, it may be totally different. And we're seeing that with a lot of these Archie properties, especially with Riverdale being popular, with uh, the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina being popular. There's more attention going to the Archie universe, and that's getting new eyes, new readers, new purchasers, and it's driving the prices up of these already scarce, already popular books. So I think uh, Mel's on to something. Um, if you see a cover that is, you know, it's older and it seems risque and out there and it's cheap, it's kind of a worthy gamble. Um, you'll, you'll be surprised a lot of times what these books can can bring on the secondary market. So definitely be on the lookout for those. Um, great pick, Mel, and uh, definitely a pick that you're only going to find here on the Hot Cold Show. And with that, that brings us to our hot list for this week. So we're going to roll right now into the cold list and... Jack, we've said this a bunch of times before, but another week where I am tending to like the cold list better than the hot list. Hot picks are great. Love them all to death. But I think there's always good nuggets, good information that you find the cold list, some buying opportunities, or it's good to see, oh, how the mighty have fallen. And we're going to roll into the cold list right now, starting with Mike Morello's pick. How's it going, everybody? Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes with this week's Cold Pick. And this week I am going with Kamala Khan spec. Um, a year ago we were talking about how great this character was, how much meat there was on the bone on some of her books. And now, honestly, you can get the whole slew of them for about half of what you could get them for a year ago. It seems like the market has largely forgotten about this character. She has not found her way into the MCU yet. Maybe she will in future phases, but for right now, um, it just doesn't seem to be hitting. Um, perhaps it's because it's a little bit of forced diversity on the, par on the part of Marvel, which fans don't generally dig. But for whatever reason, you can get books like that Amanda Connor variant for number 14 for 14, 1500 bucks now. You'd have a tough time getting that for less than two grand or 2500 um, about a year ago. The same with that second print variant for number 17. That was a $2,000 book at one point. Um, now you can get copies for six, 700 bucks. So I think if you're looking at, you know, trying to get those big variants, now might be the time to get them. But I think the three books I'm most concerned about are the ones that people stocked up on, which are this Marvel Point One uh, cameo, her number 14 cameo, and her number 17 full appearance. I mean, these books are literally half the value they were before, and they're sitting in, in shops right now. I know a shop that has three copies of this on the wall, and they can't sell it. Um, 30, 40 bucks for this thing now, about half of what it was a year ago. Same with this thing. Really tough to get for less than 200 bucks a year ago. Now copy selling for 60, 70, 80 bucks. Um, same with this thing. This is like a 20, $30 book now. Again, this was tough to get for less than 50 or 60 about a year ago. So, I mean, you're talking about, uh, you know, a big lull in value right now. I think if you're interested in these books, now's the time to get them. If you had them and didn't sell them but want to, I would say wait. Um, now is not the time. Uh, maybe wait until she does pop up in the movie or uh, some other news hits about her and then try to sell them on the high. But for now, these are my cold pick. So there we go. We have Mike Morello's cold pick. He's talking about Kamala Khan or AKA Miss Marvel. What do you think about his pick, Jack? Well, I, I like his pick, but I, I think I'm a little bit more positive than I think he was uh, about Camilla Khan. Um, I think the theme of today's show is really timing and then the spec cycle of sales. Um, I think you really hit the nail on the head earlier when you talked about that. Um, and I think you also hit the nail on the head when you talked in your intro about the value of these cold picks because this is one of those cold picks that has a lot of value. There's a lot of money to be made. The reason why prices are down quite simply is prices got driven to unreal kind of rates during the period of time where people were anticipating the possibility of Camilla Khan showing up in a Captain Marvel movie. She didn't show up, but the movie did blockbuster numbers. It's clear there's going to be a sequel. Is there any doubt she'll show up in the sequel? I mean, Kevin Feige's already said they have plans for that character. I mean, is there any safer bet to invest in than Camilla Khan? So why are these prices dropping? There's really no reason why speculators should be jumping off of these books. The only reason why prices are dropping is because people don't have the patience. They don't want to wait it out. Once they missed out on that first opportunity, they're selling and they're getting out. So I totally agree with what Mike is saying. But now is not the time to sell. Now is the time to hold. And if anything, now is the time to buy because... Once Camilla Khan hits the big screen, those prices will drive back up to their original levels. They could hit even bigger numbers because, again, that was based on anticipation, not confirmation. And those are two separate things. So once we get confirmation, 
and casting, and there's a trailer or whether it's those entertainment weekly advertisements or whatever it takes, you're going to see Camilla Khan hit the stratosphere of pricing again. Um, so now is the time to get in on a lot of these affordable books. I see those Marvel Point One sometimes at really low prices, and that was once a, a heavily in demand book, preview or not. So um, I would say be on the lookout for these Kamala Khan books. Now is the time to buy. There may not be a stronger and safer investment in the MCU than investing in Kamala Khan right now at the prices that, that she's going for at this moment. Right, and I think that brings up a good point, especially what we were just saying right before we got in the cold list, where if you're buying stuff when it's at the hot point, you're doing it wrong, and that's why the... That's one of the great things about I like about the cold list is, yes, Mike has a perfectly valid point where these are going for half price. And for us, that's the perfect time. Buy low, sell high. So if you're looking on the cold list, especially something that you want and you think there is an upside to it, it's well worth the risk at that point because you're not investing as much money as you were before. So that's the good thing about the cold list is the value that's there if you're willing to take that risk. Now, there's a good upside to it, especially if Kevin Feige mentions it, but... Don't sit there and think you're going to be able to, to scout from the cold list all the time and get a return on your investment. But there's always better opportunity than if you were buying it when it's already hot. So great pick from Mike. And now we're going to roll into the next pick on the cold list this week. And it comes from Peter Renna. So my cold pick for this week would have to be Marvel's monthly theme variants that they've been churning out month after month after month. I'm just tired of seeing it. I just really don't care about these Carnage covers coming out this month. Uh, I mean, the Venom ones that came out years ago were pretty cool, but they went to that well, what, three or four times now? I mean, they've done Age of Apocalypse, Death of X, Defenders, Champions, the Best of Bendis, Inhumans, Mary Jane covers, Phoenix covers, Marvel vs. Capcom, album covers, rock covers, action figure covers. I just had enough. So, I'm just tired of it, I'm sick of it, it's cold, Marvel theme variants. So I take it Peter doesn't like those Marvel theme variants. But, he has a good point. I mean, month after month, there's always some type of Marvel-themed variant, Asgardian variant, Venom variant, Carnage variants. But what do you think about Peter's pick? Well, I love Peter's pick because I think that that is an unsuccessful model that doesn't work anymore in the comics industry. Um, DC Comics used to do the same thing within the New 52, and they have moved off of that into art-themed variants because, again... It's the art that sells the variant cover. That's what people want. They want stunning cover art. They don't care about what your, say, concept for this cover is if the art isn't in place. So when even these themed variants are selling out, they're selling out because of what the artwork on the cover is, the importance of it, and, and kind of the beauty behind it, at least within the eye of the beholder, um, which tends to be the secondary market in this case. So... Um, you know, we've seen, certainly there is a, and there is exceptions. We've seen the battle line variants, which we've talked about on um, a lot of our programming, Brian, being popular, and uh, people kind of demanded we talk about it. Because Brian and I, when we first started writing the Wednesday one before the Wednesday Warrior article, one of our regular points was that these Marvel B variants just don't make you any money. They, they don't make the stores a lot of money. They don't make speculators any money. And they're a quick way for spe as a speculator to waste your money to tie money up in books that will just really never bring you a major return. So I, I think that the system of releasing these variants um, is broken. And I think it's great that Peter brought up the Venom variants, because I think that's what did it. We saw this with DC with the Villains variants when they released um, the, the Villains Month way back when with the Lenticular covers. Uh, a major company releases a program like this, it gets bought up, and then depending on the success or failure of speculators early on tends to be the success or failure of the program going forward. So none of us made money off those Venom variants. They looked great, but stores saw them coming a mile away. Marvel heavily pushed them to stores. Stores were loaded up on them. And even the best and most popular ones, like that X-23 Matina um, Venomized variant, was on Midtown Dollar Sales. Um, so to this day, they're not worth anything more than really cover price for any of these books. Um, and I don't expect any different from these carnageized variants that are coming up, even though several of them look absolutely amazing. So, yeah, I think Peter's I think Peter's spot on um, Marvel B variants. They need to revamp their program. Um, you know, I think it just it's tying up way too much money for retailers. I think if I was running a retail store right now, 
one of the ways I would save money and be able to allocate funds better for books that I thought were more important and that I wanted to stack up on would be to eliminate ordering a lot of these um, B, C, D, E, regular priced variants that Marvel releases that will just never be anything and end up just sitting on your shelves because readers don't want them. They want the regular cover. And then when the run gets popular, we've seen with Immortal Hulk, again, that regular cover is what people want. So, um, yeah, if your artwork isn't on point, and which Marvel doesn't even release the artwork before the solicitation half the time, there's really, uh, you know, it's really a tough sell. Um, I think we see some examples this week with uh, uh, Deadpool 13 being an amazing cover where, you know, great cover art can carry it, but I think that that book's going to be heavily ordered. And then, don't get me started, every time a B variant looks great and looks like it's going to do well in the market, what happens? Marvel allows a store to do a virgin cover and it just kills the price of the trade dress variant because now all anybody cares about is that virgin cover. So uh, I don't think these B variants are going to get hot anytime soon. And then some of them they, they have where you have to qualify for them. I mean, yeah, weird, work. wacky qualifications based on previous month's orders of different series and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. It's not, it's not an order 20 and then you get that. It's weird. Yeah. Order eighty five percent of what you ordered of Fantastic Four number four, you know. Yep. And it's tough for retailers to keep up with that. And that's why more and more you're seeing retailers throw their hands up to these uh B variants and things like that. So buy what you like. If you want them for the PC, grab them. Um from a speculation standpoint, steer clear. I'd rather miss some money. Um again, we're missing we're talking when I say miss money, you're talking about missing maybe a twelve dollar book that you could have bought for four dollars your real profitability was three dollars i don't feel like i missed anything great pick and definitely belongs on the cold list and as always all these picks if you're if you're watching this video and you agree or disagree let us know your comments as well as what are your hot picks because we are looking for comments that are being the hot picks every now and then we're going to take some of those hot picks and you'll be on the list as a guest contributor and we'll definitely give you credit for those picks so be putting your picks as well what do you think is hot and cold in comics again don't go down to specific issues we're not looking for specific issues on this list that's what the hot tens for but in general it could be authors writers um, something to do within the comic community as a whole and with that being said we're going to roll right into the next pick on this week's cold list and it comes from the hot 10 author himself ben stein hey everybody it's ben stein back again here with my cold pick of the week and that will fall on cbcs graded books Unfortunately, they just are not uh, recovering from um, all the delays and the rivets and all the other problems that they had, um, which is a shame because I think they actually have a really good product. But anyway, that's my cold pick of the week. So there we have it. And I'm sure a lot of people in the comic community would agree with them right now. CBCS has been cold for a while. Super long turnaround times. When they first came out, they promised promised 10 day turnaround times then they ran into a plastic issue and they've never really recovered the turnaround times weren't really bad but they weren't that competitive that they tried to be with cgc and now at some points i've heard people reporting turnaround times waiting on books they submitted freaking last august i did see cbcs on facebook and in the emails they sent out today that they're currently at a six week turnaround time i'm sure there's probably people that would probably differ about that but there's multiple reasons, and I think he has a valid point for why it is a cold pick. What do you think, Jack? Well, I think, you know, to bring it back to pro wrestling, you know, like we've seen with, uh, you know, the advent of AEW, um, competition is good for an industry. So it's very important that CBCS is, is doing good business so that they can put pressure on CGC so we can continue to get innovation from CGC and continue to get competitive pricing from both companies. Having said that, as a speculator, um, you know, I, I went on the CBCS train for a while, but I just can't do it because it's just, it devalues my books. I, you know, I gotta, I gotta get top dollar for my books when I'm getting them graded. And, um, it, you know, as much as I want to help out the industry or support a smaller company, you know, I just haven't seen enough from CBCS to warrant me giving up that revenue when it comes to those sales. Um, I had high hopes for the Beckett move as a sports card guy. I know what Beckett brings to that industry and that hobby. I thought they were going to be bringing more to the table than we've seen. So it'll be interesting to see if that's still coming down the pike. But as of right now, no, I mean, I, I, I personally had to make the, the move to CGC and be a CGC all the way because, you know, I'm a reseller. So I want top dollar for those books. And if, if, 
if it's not CGC, you're just leaving money on the table, unfortunately. Right. And like I always say, why I like the cold list is for opportunities. If I'm buying a book for PC, I will definitely go and look on eBay for CBCS because I know I can get it for a lesser amount. And at one time, right. it might still be that way, but there was a valued opinion where people thought CBCS graded harder than CGC. That was going around the comic community. I don't know if it's still that way. Um, so a lot of my books, I do buy CGC, and I buy them guaranteed 9-8 from Nick at Slabbed Heroes. But if I'm looking for some on eBay, especially right now, I need that Masters of the Universe number six issue from the Marvel Star Run. If it's CBCS 9.8, CGC, I don't care. I'll buy either. I just want a 9.8, and that's what I need to complete my run. But, yes, if you're looking for market or you're trying to sell or flip, CGC definitely has the market share right now. And back to what you said, we need that competition. So I am definitely hoping that CBCS does get the reputation back up, becomes who we wanted them to be when they first started, and, that, and we see uh, fruition with that Beckett merger. And that brings us to our last pick on the cold list this week, and it comes from the Run the Table author, Clint Jocelyn. Good afternoon, CBS Side Nation. Clint Jocelyn. I write Run the Table, do the Daily Poll, a couple other things. Wanted to come to you today with my cold pick of the week. Wait, 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 what is that? Is that a train coming back around? I think, I think it's that train. It's a big train that's getting louder and louder, but it's been gone for a while. Oh, look who's on board that train. Brian K. Vaughn. Yes. I'm talking about none other than Saga. Saga is out of everybody's mind right now. It's been on hiatus. Now's the time to buy. It's a cold pick, but now's the time to buy different issues that are more important than others, different issues that are relevant. Because I promise you folks, that series is going to end up on some kind of medium, whether it be TV, movies at some point. It's going to get on there. Now is the time to buy the issues. All the outside outside noises out. Nobody remembers it. It's forgotten. End of day, gone tomorrow. But yet that series is a juggernaut, and you're going to see it come back around. So my cold pick of the week, Saga. Now is the time to buy this. Get out there and find them. So there we have it, Jack. Clint's talking Saga. It has been on hiatus, and it left with a pretty good. It left with it left us with a pretty big cliffhanger. All uh a la Walking Dead 191 type style. But what do you think about Clint's pick? Well, yeah, I like Clint's pick. Um, I think that Saga, it, it's the antithesis of a popular series. I think it brought a lot of new readers into comics. I see a lot of people at comic book conventions who are Saga diehards who they weren't your typical comics readers. So I, I agree. Um, my only hesitation with Saga is... Brian K. Vaughn has gone on record saying that he doesn't see it being adapted into major media. That he said at one point, maybe a stage show, a uh, Broadway type thing would be the only way to do it. He, he felt like the cost of doing it as a major motion, motion picture or a TV series would be too much for a studio to bear. Now, that was several years ago. Has Have things changed? Has his opinion changed? I don't know. But he's got a lot of other books, a lot of other irons in the fire, and a lot of other things he can work on, like Paper Girls, that are far less um, difficult sells for him to make. So while I agree that this series is like Walking Dead level of iconic as far as an independent published series, um, I am skeptical about what the long-term uh, spec of the series, other than readers, is. Because if all you're hanging on is reader buzz, then you're going to have ebbs and flows like what we're seeing right now based on how, when the book is on hiatus or when the book is active or once eventually the book is no more. Because if the book is never adapted and then the book is no more, we may see these permanent downshifts in pricing. So if you're buying into this book now, you're buying into it either hoping for a, sh a small short-term gain when the book starts back up again, which will be there. Or you're hoping for a longer term gain if there's an adaption. And there, because of the buy in price of the saga, I'm a little skeptical. But I could be wrong. Um, you know, Hollywood, and we talk about it all the time on this channel Hollywood is buying up comics, they are adapting everything. So anything's possible. Um, but that, I, it's just important to know what ha Brian K. Vaughn has said in the past. He has said it. I also like to believe never say never. Right. But. So there's always, there's always hope. He has a good point. It is on hiatus, so the attention 
it's not on people's radar right now, so it is a good time to, to buy some of those issues up. Because whether it gets option or not, it is a great series. It's uh, next to Walking Dead. You could put it right up there with one of those modern age, I won't say grail, but it's definitely one of those highly sought after and well recognized and well rewarded series. I mean, between Brian K. Vaughn's writing and Fiona Staples' art, it's one of the best modern comics that are out there right now. Just And that's just from a reader point of view. And with that being said, that's going to wrap up our hot and cold list this week. So we will bring the list up on the screen right now. And Jack, looking at this list, right, hot and cold, what are some things that really stick out to you this week? Well, again, I like the trends that we're seeing really being highlighted in the list, the, the, the move towards whether it's 80s properties or kind of the Godzilla, the, these properties that have been um, overlooked, Conan the Barbarian, for so long, finally getting that attention. Um, speculators are looking for new places to put money, and that's very evident um, by what we're seeing on the market. So we're starting to see these trends. So no, these books haven't popped on the secondary market yet, but we're seeing the trends of these books being bought, and that's the point of this list. It's uh, something to keep an eye out for. So there you have it, guys. Once again, that's the hot cold list for the week of June 5th, 2019. So like we always say, guys, the hot cold list is exclusive first to the hot and cold video, which premieres every Wednesday at 9 p.m. So make sure you're subscribed and click on that bell notification so you get notified when those videos are dropping, as well as all the other comic and pop culture related content on this channel. We are having crazy, crazy content. We have the CBSI Bolo Show live every Thursday night where we're re recapping the hottest comic releases and the CBSI Bolo list. We have any Spotlight episodes. We had an interview with Canto creators David Boer and Drew Zucker. We also are going to have some convention exclusive content coming up. Isn't that right, Jack? Absolutely. Definitely be on the lookout for the Simple Ones Comics YouTube channel. Make sure you ring that bell, get those notifications, because we are going to be dropping all kinds of content as it relates to Heroes Con. We are going to have some of our Spec Super Team featured right in this video here. Andy Tomlin from the Indie Spotlight series, as well as Mike Morello from Cover Tunes in the building at Heroes Con, covering the event, talking to creators, and collecting content right here for the Simple Ones Comics YouTube channel, as well as comicbookinvest.com and all the CBSI social platforms. Right. And I will say, if you are going to Heroes Con and you're looking for a good booth to go to, make sure you check out Forgotten 5 Comics. We got people from the Tales from Flipside podcast. We also have Big Leg, so definitely check them out. Great booth. And their CBSI brethren. And as we mentioned, they will also have the brand new CBSI Swag.com shirts in stock at their booth at Heroes Con, debuting live for the first time. So if you're at Heroes Con, be sure to check out the Forgotten Five booth because it'll be your first chance to pick up those brand new 80s themed CBSI t-shirts. Definitely. So there again, hot and cold list for this week. Jack, is there anything else you want to say before we go? Well, I just want to thank all the writers and contributors from comicbookinvest.com who contributed to the show and the video. Uh, thank you to all the hardworking writers, even the ones who haven't contributed to the video yet, who uh, put together great content for comicbookinvest.com, as well as comicbookinvest.com owner Ben C., as well as the man behind the curtain, James. We appreciate everything you guys do, all the hard work you put in. Uh, this is the best team in comics, absolutely, hands down. And uh, you guys make this show, so we, we, we appreciate it. Right. And with that, a couple weeks ago, we had great reviews about FOMO, the puppet on the show. But stay tuned because we have some separate content that we're working out from FOMO alone. I think he's going to end up having his own show on this channel. So be on the lookout for that. Hint, be on the lookout. Kind of sounds like it goes with something else. But we'll leave it there. Let you guys think about it. FOMO show coming up on Superman's Comics YouTube channel. Be on the lookout. This is Brian with Superman's Comics. And we'll see you guys tomorrow night on the Bolo Show.